Hi, my name's John Preston. I'm the Associate Dean for Research and External Relations for McMaster Engineering. Uh, broadcasting today from my basement uh, to tell the, the you anybody who's out there a little bit about the activity. Hi, that my have name's been taking John place, Preston. I'm the uh, Associate with Dean for Research and External Relations for McMaster Engineering. Efforts that McMaster uh, Engineering has been making uh, to try to make the situation uh, a little bit better. Um, to give you a little bit of a brief history of this, uh, we had been at McMaster Engineering, had been watching this uh, because we have friends in the area uh, as the situation started to emerge within China. Uh, certainly then as, as it became clear and the impact in particular uh, in Iran and then in Italy, it became really clear that this was going to become something that struck close to home. and. Really, it became a question of how did we how do we approach that? Um, I think in a situation like this, and I want to give credit out to uh, to my boss, uh, Dean Eshwar Puri. It really comes down to not thinking so much about the process and procedures that you have in place, because none of us had ever planned for a pandemic. Uh, what you instead go to are your principles. What are your foundational principles of your organization? And so we really took a couple of principles from that. One that we would we would we wanted to be proactive and reach out and help. Two, if we were going to do that, we would need to actually expend funds. And so we immediately moved to cancel a previous competition that we had been planning to hold, or at least to postpone it, and to redirect some of those funds towards the urgent need addressing COVID-19. Uh, and then after, once you have that bias towards action and, uh, and you have a, a, some resources that at play, the next piece is that you want to be careful how you go about it. And there we knew we were facing an enormous uncertainty. Uh, and so what we ended up doing was trying, making a, 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 a policy that would be completely open and transparent about everything that we've been doing. So we've been communicating uh, to the healthcare system. We've been communicating to manufacturers. Of course, we've been communicating to the federal level and, and the provincial level of governments about all of the activities that we have been taking place. Um, before we get into, uh, and I have a number of colleagues on to tell you uh, in a little bit more detail about the projects that they've been working on. Uh, for today's session, we're focusing on, uh, in a very broad sense, uh, protective measures, things that are to, uh, to keep people safe from COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. Um, but before I get to that, there's a couple things. One is in terms of communication. Uh, for anyone out there who's interested in uh, participating, collaborating, communicating with us, if you go to the McMaster Engineering website, what you'll find is that there is a, a, a COVID-19 section on that. Uh, and there, there is a question of uh, that I believe goes by the title of are you interested in helping or something very similar to that. So that's that's actually your primary source of information about what McMaster Engineering is doing. Uh, and it's also the place to link into us. I'll also just say that if you want to know perhaps on a more current time scale or in real time, uh, my Twitter account is JS underscore Preston. Uh, please feel free to follow if you choose to. Um, that's shameless. Um, two, I have two, two urgent issues that I wanted to get to before we got to the main part of the program. And the first one has to do with ventilators, which isn't the main subject of today's conversation. Although we have extensive groups working in ventilators, working to assist people who are working in ventilators. Uh, and, and thanks to... Uh, uh, Dr. Medimavari and the Faculty of Health Science, McMaster is making big contributions in terms of testing and validating ventilator designs. Um, one of the main ventilator uh, productions uh, is currently experiencing a shortage of a certain type of part. These are Honeywell pressure sensors. So if you have, if you're a manufacturer or happens to use Honeywell pressure sensors, uh, please connect with us and we will we can let you know if you, the parts that you have in stock are the ones that are urgently required. The second one is to reach out to anyone in the healthcare system. So everyone knows that, that uh, ventilators are required, uh, N95 respirators, uh, level three surgical masks, uh, to, to a certain extent gloves and gowns. 
our our partners in Hamilton Health Science have let us know that they have uh, glide scope sleeves that they need they they see running into a shortage of. And so we have uh, reversed engineered those and we are looking for a manufacturer to help us. We're interested in any other any other dire shortage in the healthcare system such as that. Um, we can't promise to help in every circumstance, but we will certainly do our best to do that. So um, with that, uh, I'm not sure how I'm doing for time. I'm a little bit early, actually. I think I will uh, I will invite uh, Ravi Salvanopathy to join me. Uh, Ravi is the Canada Research Chair at McMaster in Biomicrofluidics. All right. So thank you, John, um, and great to be here. Um, so I was uh, asked to sort of describe the initiative that we are uh, uh, we have here on personal protective equipments. Um, I'll start with how the whole initiative got started. So I have a, a good friend and colleague in health sciences, uh, Alison Robishaw, and uh, she is in the division of critical care in Hamilton General. Um, and so she reached out to uh, to us in engineering. Uh, thinking of ways that we could potentially help the forecasted challenge in personal protective e equipment that would ensue when all the health breaks loose in North America with respect to the pandemic. Uh, so we got started pretty pretty early on, sensitized about this uh, this issue, um, and uh, and quickly John put together a, a team of people. Uh, and we divided up ourselves into various groups. One focused on masks, another one focused on face shields and uh, and other uh, personal protective uh, gears. Um, and we figured out what could we do. And one of the things that we um, identified was that um, there would be a demand for a variety of things. One is uh, to validate some materials that are that are uh, important. The other is to come up with. Uh, a way that local producers could manufacture these kinds of uh, uh, personal protective equipments. Um, and, and we've been learning uh, all along. Uh, so there is an initiative in uh, face shield uh, production. Um, we participated in uh, with, a, with a team of people uh, around the world in, uh, in coming up with a design. And that final design was then translated into production at a local company. And uh, at this time, there is um, discussion between that company and Hamilton Health Sciences in terms of sourcing these uh, these things. With respect to uh, the masks, we had uh, looked into two kinds of masks. One is the level three surgical mask um, that is used in situations where there is uh, not close contact between uh, a person with an infectious uh, disease and a healthcare professional, and then the N95 masks. And in both of them, we've looked at uh, various aspects of the project, uh, looking at uh, sourcing the right kinds of materials, trying to use other materials that are not normally used in, in medical uh, filtration, but uh, trying to repurpose that for, for these applications, but also to look at uh, simpler manufacturing processes that local industries could potentially adapt and therefore ramp up the production within within a few days or so. Uh, so this has been uh, a, a real uh, game changer in terms of uh, how I perceive work uh, going forward. So in universities, we do very detailed studies and um, discuss this in great detail and then move forward and try to find novel aspects of the work. Uh, and here what we are doing is changing our plans on a real time basis to adjust to the situations that are evolving and and situation in terms of sourcing of the materials and the equipments and so on is really fluid. So it has been a very nice learning opportunity and I'm very glad to have participated in um, this kind of, uh, of an effort. Uh, the challenges uh, going forward. So we have um, one of the surgical masks kind of products uh, being um, getting close to manufacture and being delivered to Hamilton Health Sciences. We are now refocusing our efforts on uh, the more uh, challenging N95 masks, identifying suitable materials which will provide high levels of filtration and also coming up with new ways where we could uh, get a good fit onto a person's face, which is very important in N95 as compared to a surgical uh, surgical mask. So again, the challenges have evolved over the number of weeks that we've been involved in. It has been a very steep learning curve, but it has been fantastic working together with a team of uh, um, six other uh, faculty members, 
a number of research technicians, graduate students, postdoctoral students, as well as uh, with our clinical colleagues uh, in St. Joseph's Hospital here, as well as Hamilton Health Sciences, and with the procurement team in, in Hamilton Health Sciences. And that kind of a partnership I never would have imagined could be quickly established so soon. But then I think the crisis forms this nice uh, uh, point which uh, nucleates all of these efforts and, and makes this uh, as rapid as, as possible. Uh, it is, uh, uh, there's a personal element to this as well. So my wife uh, herself, she's a physician um, at uh, Joseph Brandt um, and uh, and I've sort of seen through the, um, the the issues associated with the use of personal protective equipment and how these have been evolving in hospital settings. Um, and uh, and therefore that is, uh, that is personally motivating me to contribute as much of my time into this effort. Uh, but also the close um, relationship that I have with uh, Alison uh, Robisha, uh, built over the years on a different, completely different research project. Uh, but again, that is where we could potentially contribute to our uh, health colleagues. So these have kept me wide awake at night, but uh, it has been a fantastic experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad to appreciate your lack of sleep. Ravi. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to try to interweave. We've got some questions that have come in and if more if people have questions and please feel free to submit them and we'll try to answer them at the end of the session. I know that for many of the undergraduates, uh, there's questions about what's happening with the NSERC uh, USRA summer program and uh, and and I'll try to give some insight into that, although not final answers probably on that. So one of the questions is how many researchers are on campus and if so, how many of them? Uh, the answer here is at any given time, very few, but we have now over a hundred people who have volunteered to work on the COVID-19 projects. So we're really moving and and that's 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 a group that's that's expanding and will continue to expand. Uh, and but it's a big challenge to to manage all those people and have them one stay safe when they're on campus, but two to also be in, properly engaged and productive. R Ravi, you kind of alluded to this, but I just want to. There's some questions here about you know how long will this last? When will the la when will things be reopened? Um, what's going to happen in the future? The for me the biggest feature of working on this is the degree to which we're having to work with uncertainty. Uh, we really have no idea what, I mean, we, we get feedback from Hamilton Health Science and St. Joe's about what their needs are, and we can project that out, but even they, they admit they don't know. Uh, we all saw that when the province released its modeling that they just simply don't know. It depends a lot on the public. It's in our hands. Um, can you maybe comment on that, on how difficult it is to to work on something uh, as many of your people under your guidance have been doing without really knowing if it's going to work, if it's going to get deployed, if it's the right thing to do, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, so, so th this was a... This was something that we thought of earlier on as well. And one of the things that I did sensitize the team to was that uh, what we are preparing for is the worst possible scenario, right? So we, uh, as, as a university, we don't have the production capacity ourselves, um, but even locally, whatever gets made is not necessarily going to compete on normal times with uh, products that are being made by global manufacturers of these, these products, right? So for example, uh, an N95 mask typically costs about less than a dollar. Um, a surgical mask is basically 10 cents or so. So it's very difficult to uh, get to these price points at um, at any point of uh, point of time. But what our effort has been is that if supply chains completely break out, uh, if there is um, where we cannot source materials, we cannot source masks, countries are not going to ship across borders and so on and so forth. In those situations, what is the backstop measure that we can prepare? And our hope has been that, okay, it doesn't come down to that particular scenario, but if it does, at least we are prepared that we can supply our uh, physicians with the appropriate protective um, gear uh, gear possible. So, so they've sort of been sensitized to that, but even with that, what we, pr what we try to do is to identify what are some of the short-term uh, trends that we need to meet, and then what are the long-term trends that are evolving because of this. So one example of a long-term trend is going to be, and this is something that we are hearing from manufacturers as well, 
is that Canada, they, they are trying to bring manufacturing into Canada, uh, uh, at least a portion of their manufacturing into Canada. And the government at various levels, both the provincial and the federal level, is on board with some, some of these things. So over the long term, what we are going to see is a lot of these personal protective equipments manufacture being insourced into Canada. And as a research institution, we can build up capacity to meet those demands and, and needs. And so that is something that we are keeping in mind as we try to come up with these new designs and so on. And we are also talking with the industry partners that we have assembled to sensitize them to these kinds of things and the, the availability of facilities and so on that will come out of these projects as a way for us to interact more and develop new technologies. Yeah, I think I think the new technologies piece that you raised is is an exciting one. Uh, when we get to our next uh, guest, uh, we'll talk about and and people will be able to tie the dots how you might be able to do better than an N95 respirator, since you know what the target is. It's it's uh, it's SARS-CoV-2. So so once you know that, you can design products that are very effective for that specific target. That's not what we we're doing in the immediate term. But in the intermediate term, I think those are things that we can do. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make a comment before we before we transition, which is in addition to the urgent need to provide a backstop, as Ravi mentioned, to the people who are in the ICUs and are at the frontline healthcare, locally in St. Joe's and Hamilton Health Science, but uh, but broadly throughout Ontario. Um, there's also another, there's a ch whole chain of, of groups that have a demand. Uh, people who are working in long-term uh, care facilities, people who are working with the homeless, uh, people who are running, uh, there's, there's, there's just a very broad need. And so um, it's become increasingly clear to me over the last couple of weeks there's no worry about over overproduction of personal protective equipment. We'll be we'll be dealing with COVID-19 for a while, and there's lots of people who would either benefit, urgently need that protection, or would see some reassurance from having it. And one group that should also be included in that is the number of people who are caring for family members within their home, uh, where people may be quite sick, not hospitalized, but still quite ill and maybe requiring home care as we go forward. Uh, all right, I think uh, if we could uh, transition, and uh, again, to the students, I'll be answering questions at the end. Uh, so now if uh, Leila Salamani, Professor Leila Salamani, Canada Research Chair in Miniaturized uh, Biomedical Devices could join me. Hi, John. Uh, thanks for having me today. Uh, I'm going to give a little bit of an overview of the things we're doing. Um, so for the past few years, we've been uh, building uh, these repellent surfaces that are that we say they're broadly repellent. So they they repel a wide range of liquids as well as bacteria. And that uh, that is owed to their unique uh, physical and chemical structure. So uh, I guess our focus for the past couple of years with Professor Didar's team has been to use these as antibacterial surfaces, specifically for targeting the issues of the food industry. So cross-contamination in food production plants, uh, all the way to um, to you know cross contamination in supermarkets in in um, in or or even at consumers' homes. Uh, so. Um, we, we've always kind of had in mind of, of using these surfaces uh, against other contaminants like viruses, but uh, the, the, the recent crisis has really acted as a catalyst for us for pivoting our research and, and trying to um, focus our research in a way that we can, we can see, we can realize that societal impact. And so what we've been doing for the past, um, you know, uh, I mean, everything's moved very quickly, but the past, past few weeks has been to start collaborations with our virology colleagues at McMaster, like Professor Oshkar, and uh, to, to really see whether these surfaces that, that, that have been so effective against bacteria, whether 
Uh, they can repel first, you know, in general viruses, but even more specifically, uh, SARS-CoV-2 that is responsible for the current pandemic. And um, and so the, the strategy there is um, is um, pandemic mitigation. So one, one commonly used strategy today is cleaning, uh, free, more frequent cleaning, but uh, cleaning is not ideal because of limited resources. And uh, not just in terms of disinfectants, but also in terms of people. So, you know, uh, you you have limited number of people who can do this and then you expose people while, while you know, ex while they had to take the bus and go to their job and do more cleaning. So our, uh, what the way we see this technology is to use it in a complementary way to cleaning strategies so that um, so that you you don't have to clean as frequently, you don't have to disinfect as as frequently. But there are areas that that don't go as uh, through the thorough cleaning that, for example, hospitals go through. For example, you know, buses or supermarkets, etc. So idea the idea is the questions we're asking ourselves is whether we can use this repellent wraps that we're making. We call them the repel wrap. To, to put them in these high contact and high risk areas to, um, to reduce the risk of um, cross contamination and the increasing spread of, of COVID-19. So can you tell us uh, how the results are going to date? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, so I mean, uh, we, we are getting some good news from our uh, virology colleagues that, uh, that there are some promising results. Uh, so we are testing these now with herpes, with the herpes virus that, that is, uh, has the same size as SARS-CoV-2, and it's also an envelope virus. So, so with a similar target, we're seeing significant reductions using these wraps. And then our next step is to test this with with another coronavirus that that is a, a common cold uh, causing coronavirus. And if that study goes well, then we would we would test it with the real thing uh, to to see how effective it is in in reducing cross contamination with that virus. And that would take place at the uh, level three bio biosafety room at McMaster. Yes, that's the plan. The plan is once we get there through some other collaborations uh, with Professor Oshkar and, and some others, uh, that that will be the case. Yes. I was just throwing out a little kudos to our vice president, Karen Mossman, who was involved in the team that uh, that helped to isolate within Canada SARS-CoV-2. Um, so, Leila, is this going to be uh, one of the challenges, I would think? I mean, this is a highly engineered, structured antiviral surface. How is it possible to think about replicating it on the scale that's going to be required? Yeah, I mean, that's that's really our major challenge. Uh, how do we scale this up, both in terms of manufacturing volume and also in terms of size, right? The actual sizes that you need to to um, to cover like a pole in a in a inside a bus or inside the subway, right? So we we are looking to partner with local companies that that have already in place those manufacturing uh, infrastructure, and uh, because of our um, the simplicity of our of our manufacturing or or production. Um, we we think that with minor tweaks to their manufacturing process, we would be able to scale this up. So we're still looking into building those partnership and finding those partners to move this forward. Uh, but uh, I just want to say something, and um, that is, so we're thinking ahead. This this technology might be the most effective when people are starting to go back to work in a couple of months, and the next we're worried about the next wave, or over the next eighteen months or so, where you know we are still going to see. Um, we're still going to see infections, but they're going to be smaller. But we're just we're going to be so worried about the second wave or the third wave. So so that's where we're hoping that we're going to be ready to make that impact. And in case anybody's listening who might know of a manufacturer, what are the base materials that these would be would that would be used? Yeah. So we uh, so basically these are uh, shrink film. Um, so any any polymer that's 
uh, that's, um, that's compatible with shrink film technology would work. So we've done this with polyolefin and polystyrene. Uh, so yeah, those are the materials that 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 we've we've worked with. But anything else that can be stretched out and, and shrunk, uh, uh, that would be useful. Can I uh, the um, the approach that you're using in terms of uh, um, taking these uh, shrunken films, but then you're activating them to make them even more antiviral. Mm -hmm. um, is there an opportunity to extend that to other types of surfaces? Yeah, so there are two things that we're doing right now. I mean, we've been working on them for the past couple of uh, years, but uh, you know, they're they're slowly coming in uh, to this testing as well. We're we're developing spray. So imagine rather than having this big wrap, we have like these tiny these these wraps made into really tiny particles, and uh, that still have the same properties, still have the same components, but they're they're so small that you can spray them on. So that's one. The other is 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 a technique called pattern transfer. So we could use these structures as a mold. And then we could uh, mold it into other surfaces so that, you know, the, the application of the surface is more universal. Okay, that's that's all very exciting. Thank you very much, Professor Salamani. Uh, uh, at this point, I'm going to answer a couple of questions. I'm throwing my director kind of a loop because this wasn't in the plan. I'm uh, going to answer a few questions that have come in. Uh, and in one in particular, there's a question about, um, it's really about, the reuse of these one-time uh, masks and respirators. Uh, and uh, they're quoting that there's been some work done suggesting that they could be autoclaved. Um, what I can tell you is that we have uh, serious efforts in multiple mechanisms for trying uh, to uh, be able to reuse the mask. It's a non-trivial problem, and I'll try to give you a sense of that. Um, as Ravi mentioned during his segment, the cost of these have been knocked down by using using materials uh, that are not typically uh, suitable for autoclaving. Um, and so the, the, the concern about autoclaving is twofold. Probably the biggest concern is that, particularly for an N95 respirator, that the material would degrade and you would no longer be able to get the tight fit over your face, um, which would then render it uh, no longer a respirator. Um, the second more subtle thing is that uh, these filtration systems have built into them um, an electric and a metastable electrostatic charge, which allows them to have a very high efficiency for small particles, and that most of the mechanisms will degrade that material to some extent. So in addition to making sure that the, the mask is still structurally intent, uh, in these tests, it's important that we measure to see what is the quality of the filtration before and after. And so we've been working to measure it against uh, an N95 standard um, uh, to see how, how high the quality is for a variety of mechanisms. We're reaching out to and, and looking at partners with multiple companies that have, um, uh, have ideas for how you would uh, sterilize and be able to reuse these. And it's really about trying to find that nice fit where ease of use uh, and ability to handle the volume that's required, uh, quality of filtration post-processing and understanding what that is and telling that to the healthcare workers so they know exactly what they're getting. Uh, and then the, the quality of the fit that would come afterwards uh, to make sure that there isn't air leakage between the between the foods. Um, the, um, the other question that I wanted to make sure that I got to was, uh, was to do a, talk a little bit about the summer research program. Um, this is both our summer research program for the US. Well, I'm going to talk about the summer research program principally for the USRAs, but there may be other students who are able to participate in the summer program. Um, first of all, going into this, uh, and this is an area that I was involved in in normal times. Uh, we at McMaster Engineering are extraordinarily proud of our undergraduate researchers. And as of last year, we had the largest uh, undergraduate research program of any engineering program in Canada. Uh, I, 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 
uh, kudos to our good friends at the University of Toronto. According to our records, we had one more student. So anytime you can stand up against a university like Toronto, that's a good thing. Uh, so we have this. So we wanted we really didn't want to let that go. And so we we reached out to NSERC and got a commitment that NSERC was going to continue to provide funding, even if people were working from home. Uh, and then we started to work with our faculty members to see if they would be able to come up with ways. It took it some time. And so the program is going to go forward. I don't know that it's going to go forward at exactly the same size. We're still developing what are the what are the projects that students could do. The projects they will end up doing will not be exactly the same as the ones they thought they were signing up for. So people may choose not to participate. But in addition to participating in the research activities, we're also looking at providing uh, other other opportunities for the students, um, uh, putting you together into clusters. Uh, so that there's a socialization aspect in, in the forming of a cohort. So you'll get a chance to meet friends and share share your experiences in different labs uh, and also putting together some uh, instructional programming for you. Uh, uh, currently, one's being developed in intellectual property. So there's a lot of exciting things that are going to happen on the USRA program. Information about that is currently going out onto the website and will be coming to you more the, the, the important details will be coming to you through your home department over the next few days. Please, please have patience with that. With that, I want to invite a student who's been uh, involved in research already on the COVID crisis, uh, Amanda Tompkins. And Amanda's on. Okay. So Hello, I Amanda. Um, yeah, so I'm Amanda. I'm currently a third year uh, iBiomed student and I'm studying electrical and biomedical engineering. Um, so yeah, I've been involved in the research, um, I guess, kind of from a few weeks ago. It's been very recent, but I've been really wanting to get involved. Um, just watching the news at home um, and even uh, I'm from Barrie. So the first death of COVID actually occurred in Barrie. So that really hit home. That is something that we need to start getting involved with and um, taking action towards. Okay, so, sorry, and I've, I've got a, I've got a, I, apparently I was not clear. The, the USRA program that I was talking about will be taking place in a virtual uh, work environment. Uh, so that at this point, we will not be bringing USRA students onto campus um, until the situation changes. And if you ask me how long that will be, I'm afraid my answer has to be, I honestly do not know. So but now if we can maybe go back, Amanda, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the challenge that you heard about and, and tell us about your terrific solution? Um, yeah, so basically, I guess it was a couple of weeks ago, um, our prof, Dr. Fang, put an announcement out to our class asking for volunteers to help with the COVID initiative. Um, and the challenge that they posted was to come up with a some sort of mask that could be used um, similar to an N95 um, that would provide a tight seal, but also be more comfortable. Um, and if you look in the news, then there's all the pictures of the doctors and nurses who wear them for 12 hours straight, having these bruises and marks um, from having to keep the mask so tight. So this problem was that they wanted us to create some sort of mask um, and they also wanted us to kind of come up with a solution for the uh, reduction in N95 so that we could um, still create an airtight seal without having N95s. Um, so what I did, um, me and my sister, she's a nursing student, so she gave me a lot of input into how the N95s work, how they fit, um, and just overall um, how the like how the air flows, how they're supposed to fit. Um, and we basically designed a seal that would be attached on the face and then a normal surgical mask um, would be able to go over top and be clamped in place so that it would create an airtight seal um, if there's no N95s available. Um, so one of the main problems with the surgical masks is they have a lot of air that can still go in um, through the sides or through uh, around the bridge of the nose or under the chin. Um, so our solution was to design um, a mask that would stop this and um, eventually as we go further in our process and our prototype um, we'll include more filters but for now it's to kind of create that airtight seal to help prevent um, health workers from being exposed as much and forcing all the air through the surgical mask um, and how we did this is we chose to use a silicone material um, so if you think like a CPAP machine how it has the um, seal and it kind of folds in this would allow for the seal to go on the face um, 
without having to have such a force to pull it as tight. Um, and it also means that it's lightweight and more comfortable than the material, like the metal clamp holding on um, to the nose. So um, basically that was our general design that we have uh, put forward and we're currently doing prototyping uh, to develop it. Okay, so can you tell me about the time delay that it took between submitting your uh, your idea and getting a response back? Yeah, so we sent, uh, we found out about the project just say on a Wednesday, and then by Friday we found out fully what the details were. For, uh, Saturday night I submitted my proposal, and then Sunday I got a response from Dr. Preston, and then Monday they were like, we're going to start looking into this in manufacturing. So it was very like like very overwhelming and it happened so quickly. Um, but it goes to show that there is a really big urgent need um, to get a mask and help kind of create a solution um, to help create more PPE for the health line work or health care workers and frontline workers. Yeah. Um, so Amanda, how do you, how, how have you found it transitioning from being on campus every day? I assume you did come on campus every day uh, and, uh, and working from home. And do you, can you give us any insights about how it might work uh, for undergraduates conducting research from home? Um, yeah, so I mean, the first week I didn't know about this, so I was at home kind of procrastinating. I even uh, shaved my dogs, gave them a haircut. Um, so I was really trying to procrastinate and not do schoolwork. Um, but then as we heard more and more about the news, um, I realized that there was more of a need. So a lot of the research that we're doing is from home. Um, it's a lot of like Skype calls or FaceTime or Teams uh, chats, kind of discussing, getting ideas out. Um, so very few of us are actually at the school. Um, like I said, I'm located in Barrie and I've been working remotely. Um, so for our project, we have uh, gathered seven, around seven different students um, working on prototyping, um, manufacturing and testing and protocols. So we have um, the majority of the students working remotely. And then we do have a few students that are in the lab, but they have um, been granted special access and there's a lot of certain protocols that they have to follow. Um, and their job is to make the actual prototype. Um, but we're trying to basically uh, make sure that everybody can do what they can from where they are to stop limiting um, and stop people from moving around. Um, a lot of it you can do at home. Uh, you'd actually be surprised, um, but it is a lot of uh, communications with emails and, uh, like I said, Teams chats, kind of figuring that stuff out. Um, it is good, like, we've done a lot of, like, catting and that kind of stuff, so um, a lot of, like, the actual prototyping can be done um, outside of the lab, so that's a very good thing. Um, what do you, uh, We heard a couple of comments earlier about Really, I guess some speculation, but it's not so much speculation. We've been told to expect that we will not be in a normal situation anytime very soon, right? Mm -hmm. How do you think the students are going to adapt to that? I mean, it's one thing to have a short-term crisis, uh, to have something like this happen at this critical juncture. Um, and and what do you think? What do you think we should do to help the students to get through to this? Um, well, I mean, it has been a, li a little bit of a learning curve. I mean, we even had, um, we had a test and um, it was the first time they've done it online. So um, obviously the results weren't as ideal as possible, but um, adapting, uh, the profs have been pretty good at adapting the courses um, and modifying them so that we're still able to get things done. Um, so I think the main thing is getting people, um, adapting them in a way that it works with the online environment. Um, and kind of getting everybody involved in that way. Um, I think it takes some time and it takes some learn and it does take an adjustment. Um, but I do think that the longer and just the more we're, we're here, then it'll become more and more nature, um, course in nature. I think definitely changing uh, class times so that they're a little bit later is definitely beneficial because I know, at least for me, uh, through all this, my sleep schedule has been thrown in a, a whirlwind. So. Um, being able to go and just watch lectures later and stuff, that's been really helpful so I could still get my work done, but everything's just been shifted. And um, yeah, it, it's it's manageable and it's going. Um, I think it's been done pretty well though so far. All right, well, thank, thank you for that. I'm, I'm, I'm really curious to see this dog of yours now. Uh, <laughs> she's, she's upstairs. <laughs> How yeah. did that turn out? Um, I have two golden doodles, so they're both big dogs. So 
Um, I did okay, but I didn't get a few mats out. So my dad took uh, the shaver to her and he took her right down. So she looks a little funky. Um, <laughs> so that wasn't my doing. That was my dad's. But um, otherwise, they look okay. So if you have two dogs, I guess you can you can practice on one first and then hopefully the other one gets in. <laughs> well, that was it. Yeah. We'll work on the younger one first. So. OK, I guess I guess the the. Um, so thank you very much. Oh, by the way, have you told your parents I've, I've rechristened Amanda to be Amanda Mask now? Um, and I, I was are your parents OK with me changing your last name? Um, yeah, my mom kind of was in our video the other day, so she kind of overheard. So she she understands um, as long as I can still get onto my Mac stuff, then it's all good. <laughs> I still need to do right. my assignments. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. So, for so some of the other questions that have come in um, and we may end up wrapping up early, depending on how many more questions we get. Uh, there's a question. What are what are some of the other COVID research initiatives that are underway? Um, I mentioned I mentioned the ventilator projects and and those associated with that, um, but there's some really interesting ones. So the the Puri Lab is working on 3D printing human cells for use in in uh, disease modeling and drug screening, and this is hopefully a mechanism to try to uh, accelerate the rate at which. Um, treatment options can be can be brought forward. Um, I happen to know that lab is also starting to think about uh, tests to uh, identify individuals who have the antibodies associated with COVID-19, uh, which would then allow us to identify those people who are no longer at risk. And this is very important from a population dynamics to get a better handle on that. Um, uh, Will DeCockney in, in civil engineering is leading an effort to do systems modeling uh, to predict how our Ontario systems will hold up to a crisis. This is actually crucially important if you, um, uh, the, um, the modeling of these pandemics is not, it's not as if it's uniform in terms of the number of cases across Canada. We of course know that. We know that Ontario and Quebec have, have stricter problems, but it's also not even within that province is it a uniform problem. These are really regional regional pandemics that are all linked together. Uh, and so that means that the strain on the healthcare system is going to be different in different parts of the province at different times. And so Wales project is to try to be able to predict where those stresses are going to become most acute so that uh, resources can be deployed there. Very important. Um, and uh, Montez Mohammed, also in civil engineering, is starting to look at how to use data to advise transit services on how to help people to access grocery stores and pharmacies while maintaining physical distancing. So again, I think there's a there's a whole string of things, and this is really what where where our sense of the situation is that. Um, we've gone through the exercise, and I think Ravi did a terrific job of giving you a sense of what it was like, what we now think of as the early days of this, which was only relatively few weeks ago. Um, and now we're starting to think, what are we going to do in that intermediate and longer term? Still facing all of these uncertainties, but but better to be begin being prepared. So that's something for those of you within the McMaster ecosystem, I think, to think about. Um, how can we st continue to innovate? How can we continue to collaborate? Uh, how can we engage with external users uh, to try to anticipate some of the challenges that are going to happen? I don't know what the world's going to be like when we have to continue to social distance, but we're trying to go about our daily lives. Uh, but I would, I think, I think McMaster Engineering is exactly the place uh, where people should start thinking about that. Uh, again, along with our collaborators across the university and in the community. Uh, so I'm thinking we're going to wrap up a little bit early because I don't see any further questions. Uh, okay, so I think I think I would like to. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, OK, this is a great question. Uh, how do you control the porosity to be sp smaller than a virus in a prototype mask? The answer is you cannot. 
If you were to do that, you would not be able to breathe through that mask because there's no way that you could produce enough pressure to suck the air. So that's why you need, I, I mentioned these electrostatic filter processes. Uh, it really is an interesting process where the very small particles first become acquire an electric charge and then get pulled towards one of the surfaces and trapped. So that's one of the important things uh, that are used. Okay, we're starting to get some questions coming in. Often we use radiological sources to sterilize surgical equipment. Given McMaster's strength that and that radiation is is used for, why not try it? That's okay. That's an interesting question. I I don't know if that's coming from either of the two people who reached out to me uh, yesterday uh, to tell me that we had a cobalt uh, sixty, I believe cobalt sixty source that would be ideally suited for this. Uh, so the answer is that yes, we found out yesterday that there this is an option. Um, there's a lot of things to consider about that uh, because certainly you don't want the personal protective gear to become uh, activated. Uh, but the Cobalt 60 source does seem to be the right source to consider for this. And so I will, I've begun the process of reaching out to the people, the appropriate people uh, to find out what would be the capacity, how many how many masks, how many respirators would would we be able to handle in that circumstance? And if it's if it's of a scale that it would make a difference, then absolutely we'll be looking into it. Oh, what are the actions that have been taken to reopen the labs as soon as the province lifts the social distancing measures? Um, what are the, uh, well, um, obviously, we're not taking any actions to reopen the labs until we do get approval to do that. Uh, but I think we're beginning to develop a philosophy. So because we have these COVID related research programs in place and because we have people who are going on to campus to access facilities there, we've had to develop a set of protocols for that they would have to follow. Actually, I'll give a shout out to Professor Salamani again. Uh, she was the first one to initiate this for her own lab uh, and the faculty adopted those and have been working to refine them since then. Um, so I think these protocols are going to be very important. What we're going to want to do is not to just, oh, it, we're not going to go from where we are now, lockdown to wide open. That's, that's, that's not going to happen. Uh, instead, what will happen is that there will be a sequence of ways to do this. And the better we are at obtaining the same outcomes that we're getting now with severe physical distancing, with less severe physical distancing, but by being careful, careful about hygiene, uh, employing technologies appropriately, perhaps having masks more widely available to more people, uh, using uh, apps and scheduling tools to sequence when people access a site, uh, common courtesy about how to how to how to how to walk around without without being, uh, and of course a scrupulous scrupulous self-regulation that if you're showing symptoms that you do immediately self-isolate that you do report and hopefully in the near future we'll have rapid testing available to identify if you have a problem if we can do those if we are able if we get the testing in place and other things then it may be possible with under the experts advice to start to allow us to have less physical distancing as long as we're not uh, as long as we're able to test very quickly. We also need more science. We need to know how this virus spreads uh, in, in better detail, and there's still too much uncertainty about that. So I think, I think those are the interesting challenges that'll come. The protocols that we're developing now, though, will prove to be important. I'm convinced of that. Uh, in the longer term, this is going to be a hazard that we have to deal with, but engineers are used to dealing with hazards. We work with high voltages. We work with dangerous chemicals. Uh, we work with radioactive materials and we have protocols for how to manage those risks. We're going to have to move into a world where we have protocols to manage the risk from COVID-19, at least until we get to a vaccine. Uh, question for Layla. Layla, please, if you'll join me back on. Yes. The question is, how scalable and or expensive is the process of coating surfaces with this repellent material? 
Can we expect its widespread application in the near future? Yes. Yeah, so, so because we build this on an already existing uh, material, the shrink film, we think that uh, it's going to be scalable and it's going to be able to, to make a commercial impact. We think the costs, I mean, I wouldn't be able to give you a number, but the additional costs uh, moving from a commercial shrink wrap to this repel wrap is, is marginal. So, uh, so we, you know, we, we just we we need some chemicals to add to that that rock, but but we think it's going to be manageable. All right. So I guess I'll I'll now move towards I'll, I'll try to wrap up again, but if more questions come in, we'll answer them. Oops. Okay. <laughs> How can I get involved to help with COVID nineteen related research efforts? Oh, well, I, I did mention that we have our website and to go forward there. Um, I think also uh, if you go, if you uh, retweet on my Twitter feed, that will also get my attention. Um, but uh, but what I what I what I really want you to want people to think about is not just how you can help with the existing ones, but how you can start to help us to reimagine Reimagine a world where this, where where we're coming through this current crisis, and we're managing in a in a the best way possible to maintain quality of life, to maintain equity, to maintain all the things that we, free personal freedom, all the things that we cherish, uh, and and it's time to start. It is time to start thinking about those things. How are we going to do it? And from an engineering perspective, it's a question of listening to other people. What are the needs that are there? and trying to adapt and see what can we do that's going to help us to make to help us address those needs. So um, that kind of looking forward and figuring things out and figuring out what the big challenges are, I would encourage everyone if you're volunteering, don't be afraid to volunteer to throw out a challenge. I think we're going to need to figure out how to do this. Um, what we have found with our colleagues in the healthcare system, I think we surprised them by the number of things that we could do. So give us the challenge. Uh, we're not promising we can meet them all, but we will certainly give it a we'll certainly give it a shot. Uh, and I think, in particular, shout out to Amanda. Um, our faculty members are absolutely terrific. McMaster University has some of the best faculty, uh, not just in the country but in the world. Uh, but McMaster Engineering, our students are absolutely amazing. So there's six thousand of them. Um, I think we're, it's an unlimited resource to tap into in terms of ingenuity uh, in making things happen. And so, so let's get to it. Thanks everybody for joining me today. Um, I probably this will be the last telecast I ever do, but anyhow, thank you for joining me. <laughs>